maybe some of you are with me on this, you have kids or you have uh, maybe when you was a child even, or maybe you have nieces and nephews or or uh, whatever it may be that you took to the mall when they were a child or, or whatever it is, and, and on Easter or on Christmas, and you know what it's like. The line is from here to Fort Gay, and they're all lined up to go sit on Santa Claus's lap or on the Easter Bunny's lap. You remember that, right? And you remember what it was as a child working your way up through there, and you're thinking, yeah, this is going to be fun. I'm going to get an, uh, some Easter eggs, and I'm going to... And then when you see that huge head on that huge rabbit with teeth about that long, you think, I cannot do this. Or your kids maybe, or you're standing in line and getting ready, and and this is going to be fun, and we're going to have pictures taken, and we're going to put them on Facebook, and next thing you know, they're climbing you like a white oak. You know what that's like, right? They're scared of something that is... Not something to be scared of. It's the Easter Bunny. Don't You don't have to be frightened by the Easter Bunny. He's just sitting there. He's not going to hurt you. How many times do you say that? It's standing in line. He is not going to hurt you. My sister's not here this morning, so I can tell you this. When she was 16 years old, we went somewhere and, and down to, to Disney, and we're sitting there eating breakfast. This girl is 16 years old. If she would have been a Jew in the first century, she would have been married with kids already. And we're at this breakfast, and Mickey Mouse, not the real one, just, you know, a guy with the Mickey Mouse head, comes around the corner, and she starts flipping out. 16-year-old woman. And I'm 12 years old, standing, sitting beside her, and she's in my plate, she's on my lap, she's on my head. She sees there's nothing to be scared of, Andy. It's Mickey Mouse. It's a, it's, a, it's a dude in a costume. Now, that's funny. But, you know, oftentimes we come to scriptures like that. We've heard of a certain word. We've heard of a certain doctrine. We, 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 we're working our way through Romans 8, and I know how you all are. You say, I know what's coming, and I'm scared of it. As your pastor, I want you to know that there is nothing to be scared of in the verses that I'm going to read. There's nothing to be scared of in God's Word. No, you accept it by faith and you trust the one who wrote the book. He's not someone with a mask on trying to play a prank on you. You do not have to dread verses in the Bible. You don't have to be scared of him either. Romans chapter 8. Matt Chandler said this is uh, an elbow room sermon. It, what it means is, is for all you visitors, most of you won't be back next week because I've preached in a sermon. It gives our members some more elbow room. If we have any more elbow room, I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> Romans chapter 8 verse 28. But now listen, I, I, I want to give a disclaimer. We don't pick and choose what we preach. So it's not like we're in Romans 8, 28 today because I felt like this week we should be there, you know. We've, we've worked through the text. We've worked verse by verse through Romans chapter 8. And so now we've come to, to a couple of hard passages, but we don't have to be scared. No, we, we know who wrote the book. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. If you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is God's work. You may be seated. I want you to look with me in verse 28. 
Verse 28, I believe in the ESV, is, is a little tough for us to understand. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to this purpose. We read that verse and we read it over and over again and we think, well, all these things are working good in my life. But that's totally different than where I was yesterday when I stood beside the casket of a woman and her husband of, of 35 years is standing there and he's saying goodbye. That's not a good work, is it? Is that really working something? And if we don't watch, we get lost in the translation and we, we, we mix up who's doing the work and who's not doing the work. The work is not doing the work. Say amen. God is doing the work. Now, if we read this in the NIV or the, the, the NLT or the New American Standard, let me read it to you in a couple different versions. The NIV says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. So we put now God as the subject of the sentence. Who's doing the work? God is doing the work who have been called according to his purpose. The New Living Translation says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Also, the New American Standard, probably one of the most literal translations that we have, says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. I don't want you to get hung up on this. It's not the things that are working. It's God that is working through the things and in the things and by the things. You see that in most translations, there's an and right there at the beginning of verse 28. So when we see an and or we see a but, that's, a, that's a, something that connects us back to the following. What did we talk about last week? Oh, you didn't know there was going to be a quiz this week, did you? We talked about suffering. And so coming out of this, Paul says, out of this suffering, out of all this, and we know, we know, we know that God is working all this out. Through my suffering, through my pain, through whatever it is, God is at work now we have to understand the context of, of of the book of these verses we often say that that paul is writing to the church in rome and we think of the church as like what we see here today let me show you something uh, you stay where you're at and let me read you this verse romans chapter 1 verse 7 says to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. He's not writing to a church that has lost people and, and, and saved people in it. Now listen to me. When he's writing to the church, he's writing to believers. The church is believers. You can come here as much as you want. We want you to come. If you're lost, if you know that you are lost and undone, we want you to come and hang out with us. We want you to come and, 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 and do the things that we do and, and hang around us and, and be around us, right? But you're not the church. You see, the church in Rome was, was those who loved God, those who were called to be saints, a specific group. And we, us believers, know. You see, if you try to tackle the next few verses without knowing who he's speaking to, you will lose your mind. You'll have one of the Easter Bunny episodes. And links us back to this idea of suffering and connects us back up to what he's been talking about. And we know. We don't hope. We don't hope so. We know. We know what? That in all things, God is working. Notice he did not say, in all good things. I don't know if you know this or not, but bad things happen to good people. And good things happen to bad people. 
Listen, being a Christian, being uh, one of His, doesn't uh, exempt you from the hard times in life. If you've had a hard time in your life, would you raise your hand? If you've ever come upon something in your life that was tough, you know what I'm talking about. He doesn't say in all good things. No. He says in all things. So we can say in suffering, God is working. Say amen. In heartaches, God is working. Say amen. In sickness, God is still working. In joy, God is working. In pain, God is working. In death, God is working. As I look back over my life, the many, many times that I've totally blown it, God was working. You say, Chris, and he, he made you do that? No, 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 no. No, I made the mistake. I sinned. Yet God is working. You blowing it doesn't push him off the page. You messing up and you sinning and you dropping the ball and, and, and you making an absolute wreck of your life for the last however many years does not change that God is still working on your behalf in the circumstances in your life if you are one of His. Notice it says here that it's, it's, it's all things for those who are called. Those who love Him. I can tell you, friend, that if you're here lost, God is not working on your behalf. He's not working all things out for your good. But I can say this, that if you're my friend, you're my neighbor, and you're lost, He's working it out for mine. Oh, you see, if you're here and, and you don't know Him, you better run. You better run to him because he's working all things out for my good. All things, God works. Things don't work, but God works. For what? For those who love him. Uh, let me say this. You're not a Christian unless you love him. If, if you say that you've done this and you've done that and and you've been saved, and, and, but you don't love him, you've never been saved. I can say that with mathematical exactness. I can say it because what the verse says. For the good of those who love him. Who are those who love him? Who have been called according to his purpose. And you see, this calling he's talking about here is the effectual call. What's effectual mean? It means it's effective. When God calls you, answer. It's not like when you call me and I put... Uh, call later or I text you I'll, I'll call you back no friend when God calls your name you answer and you say well he's called my name before and, and I answered no oh no friend a phone call might be more than just one ring all those whom he calls they'll come this is an effectual call who are those who love him? Those who are called according to his purpose. See, we get all this mixed up, don't we? We think this is about my purpose. We talk about my purpose in life. What is my purpose in life? Let me tell you something, friend. You were called, you were brought into the family, to the fold of God according to his purpose. You are secondary in the relationship. Every good, I, every time that me and Heather goes out somewhere and, and I preach and she'll sing, I get to play the guitar for. If you've ever heard me play the guitar, you know that, that she's a lot better singer than I am a guitar player. So I had this joke. My joke is this. Every good duo, there's one that's, that's the star and there's one that's not. So like Brooks and Dunn, you know, that one guy, he can't sing a lick, right? Sonny and Cher, Sonny was just along for the ride. Heather and Chris, Chris is just along for the ride. And we can say that about you and God. In every good duo, there's a star. Friend, let me tell you something. The star is not you and the star is not me. The star is him. Oh, you see, 
those who love him. Why do you love him and your friend doesn't? Why do you love him and your brother doesn't? It's not, not because you're smarter than your brother. You might be. That's not the reason. It's because you were called according to his purpose. Good theology always puts man down and God up. So when you start hearing these jokers on TV, say amen. When you start hearing these jokers on the radio talking about how great you are, uh-oh, bad theology. Run from it. I'm here to tell you this. God is for us. Believers, God is for us. God is working. You love God, right? You really love him. You're devoted to him. The people who love him, you are the one who are called according to his purpose. And what's it say? That God is working. God is, is, is doing this. God is, is doing that. He's, he's working for those. He's working to an end. Working for the good. What is for the good? The For the good is, is, is not a good life. For the good is, is, is not a big bank account. For the good is not a big fat retirement one day. For the good is not uh, selling strawberries on the beach somewhere. Man, that sounds good, doesn't it? That's not the good that we're talking about. It's not about relaxation. It's not about you being happy. It's not about your wealth, and it's not even about your health. All those things are great, but that's not what God is working for in your life. It's not the end that God is working to with you. No, it tells us later on in the text, what what is God working in your life for? Look with me in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, and then we stop. Uh, okay, no. To be conformed to the image of his son. That is the good for you, friend. The good for you is to be made like his son. Amen. Now, commentators are, are divided on this. Some say that this means only when we get to heaven we're going to be like him, which that's true, right? But let's listen. It's also him making you like his son on the here and the now. You see, Brother Dick always said, no change, no Jesus. I can tell you if someone's been changed. Why? Because God is conforming him to the image of his son. He is molding him and making him more like Jesus today than he was yesterday. So we have to stop and say, now... Am I more like Christ today than I was when I started this? Or am I banking on something that never happened? You see, if he calls, he changes you. God is working in your life to make you more like his son. Aren't you glad that it's God working in your life to make you more like his son and it doesn't say you better be working to be more like Jesus? I've heard that all my life and I have failed miserably at it. I got to be more like Jesus. Oh, no. And every time I fail and I fail and I fail and I fail, but you know what it does? It reminds me. Oh, you're not perfect, big boy. But he is. Keep trying. Keep striving. Keep pushing. But know this, that if you are, are any more like Jesus today than you was yesterday, it's because God is working inside you. And so we see that, that, that all these things, in all these things, God is the one who is working. We see this in Moses, don't we? Hebrews 11 tells us, By faith, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents. 
They were going to kill Moses, but Moses, what, his parents, they hid him. And then they put him in the Nile, and they, they sent him off. Can you only imagine putting your three-month-old child in a basket in a raging river? Could you honestly sit on the shore and watch it go down the thing and say, this is going to be a good thing? God's got a wonderful plan for my life. This is my best life now. No, as the baby floats off in the river, you say, there goes my life. Ah, oh, but friend, God is working. As the baby floats down the river, God is working. There's an Egyptian princess that needs to have a bath just at the right time. And he floats up. Wow, God is working. Oh, but Moses is raised as a prince of Egypt, isn't he? And Moses goes along and, he's, and things are going well for him. And, but he knows he's a little different. He knows he's a little removed. And then he sees someone being mean to one of his people. And what does he do? In a fit of rage, he blows it. He kills the guy. Moses, you had it all. And you blew it. Oh, friend, God is working. He buries him in the sand and he goes on about his life. And then someone a little later says, what, are you going to do me like you done him? Oh, but God is working. He leaves Egypt. He goes out and he hangs out in the wilderness. He's not hanging out for two weeks. He's not hanging out for four weeks. He hangs out for decades. Oh, but God is working. He comes back and he leads these people out. He goes back to, to, to the place where he was raised and he tells them, I have to take my people out of here. These are God's people. God is working. Frogs cover the land. Locusts fills the houses. And the death of the firstborn hits the land. There are millions of dead baby boys. God is working. We've seen it in Joseph, too. Remember Joseph? He was thrown in the pit because his brothers were jealous of him. They took him down to Egypt. He's hanging out in Egypt. He's in jail most of the time. God moves him up to a place of prominence, and what happens? His brothers are sitting before him after his daddy dies, and he says, they're all scared to death that he, he's going to change his mind, that he's going to kill them. And what does he say? As for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. Those brothers were responsible for the decisions they make, yet God is sovereign over it all. We see it in Peter's life too, though, don't we? We, we, we followed Peter the last three nights and, and, and Peter was called and, and, and Peter was doing good and then he'd mess up and then he'd do good and then he'd mess up. And then, then at the end, what happens? The end of right before Jesus is crucified, he's warming his hands by the fire and a little girl looks at him. He's one of those. No, 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 no. I have no idea who he is. I love what the NLT says that, that when they came after Jesus was crucified, Peter thought he had lost it all. He's hiding in a corner somewhere. Thought that it was all over, but he knew he had a love for him. Peter had absolutely blew it. But when he, they, the women came and said, he's alive. What did Peter do? He jumped up and ran. Because the resurrection changes everything. You see... Even though Peter messed up, even though Peter dropped the ball, even though Peter had, had, had totally blowed it, guess what? God was working in the circumstances and the things of life to make Peter like his son. You say, Chris, that's, that's good. Point number one, God is for 
no matter what you're going through right now, no matter what hardship you're going through, no matter if it's financial, no matter if it's sickness, if it's death, God is for us, believer. But look with me now in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew. So these people that he loves, these people that he has called. Now, Paul explains this in detail. Those whom he foreknew. Now listen, let's be very clear. This does not mean that God knew ahead of time who would have faith. It doesn't mean that God knew ahead of time who would be saved. Although God knew that. That's not foreknowledge. That's omniscience. He knows all things. It's a given. But foreknew. You see, it's not that he looked down the corridor of time and he seen who would accept him. It wasn't that he looked down the hallway of time and seen who would be Christian. No, that, that makes it to where he is reacting to something that you do. Let me read a verse to you. Philippians 1.29 For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. What has been granted to you? If you believe in Christ, it has been granted to you. Your belief in God has been granted to you. John Carson says that if, if, if this was contingent on you, and let's just say um, I stand with, with my brother-in-law one day. I shouldn't say brother-in-law. I mean, uh, my first grade friend. And we stand one day and, 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 and God says, you're saved and you're not. If it was because of something that I'd done and that he didn't, as eternity rolls, who gets the glory for that? I do. No. That's not how this works. Listen to me. You've got the Easter egg or Easter bunny look on your face right now. Those whom he foreknew. For means what? Before. And knew is knowledge. But it's not just knowing. Let me prove it to you. Amos 3, 2 says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. God speaking to his people. Of all the families of the earth, only you have I known. Did God know every person? Come on now. Did anybody come to church this morning? Did God know every person on the earth at that time? But he just says here, but his people, he knew. Oh, you see, this knowledge is a different kind of knowledge. But we see it again in Genesis 4.1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. And you say, oh, okay. He just knew her. He, oh, there's, there's Eve. Finish the verse. And she conceived and bore Cain. Oh, no, this is an intimate knowing. James Montgomery Boyce says foreknowledge means that salvation, now listen, has its origin in the mind of and eternal counsels of God. It focuses our attention on the distinguishing love of God. Oh, friend, listen. He foreknew you. He set his affection upon you. He set his eye upon you. I wrote down here, his love was set on you. His affections were set on you. In eternity past, before the wind ever blew upon the sea, before an angel ever sung a song, before heat of the sun was ever radiated, he loved you. Unlike any other love you have ever experienced, God loved you. Now listen. You say, well, then, then, then what about this and what about that? You know what the problem is we have? The problem is, is we bring questions to the text that the text does not answer. He's speaking to believers. 
So quit thinking about unbelievers right now. Get it? Why are you thinking about this one and that one? No. He's speaking to you, believer, church member, follower of Christ. He foreknew you. He loved you before the world ever existed. We could, we could very rightly interpret this or translate this as foreloved. He foreloved you in an intimate way. You see, Paul starts out Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, right? This should be something for you to stand on. When times get hard, when you're suffering, when, when things are falling apart, He knew me before I was and He loved me. He set His eye upon me. Oh, wretched man that I am. It goes on in Romans 9, before the twins were ever born, one doing right or one doing wrong, he set his love upon one. Quit thinking about the other one and start thinking about you. Believer, he loved you. I love how he says this, he foreknew, just as he foreknew his son in eternity past. He knew you and he loved you. The second verb there, though, let's look with me. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Oh, I read this verse one time in a funeral and people got up and left. I'd never seen nothing like it before. It's the Easter Bunny again. I said that word just now and some of you said, I brought my friend today. Why did you have to say that word? But I don't know if it's in your Bible like it is mine, but it doesn't skip over it, does it? That's why I like Whitney putting the stuff up on the screen. That way you know I'm not making it up. For those whom he foreloved, he also predestined. What does this predestined mean? It means to determine something ahead of time. To predetermine something. You say, Chris, that's not fair. You're not thinking as a believer. You're thinking as an unbeliever. Snap out of it. Think of us as a child of God. He foreloved me. But he didn't just leave me be. He predestined me. In, in the original language, the, the word is used, is also used as, as a word that means marking out a boundary beforehand. And as I was studying this, I thought of when I was a child. When I was five years old, the, the house that we lived in and the store, we lived over top of the store, it burned. We were inside of the house. The store burned. A few days later, my grandfather who owned the store, he died. The well went dry a few days later. Things were bad. Looking back now, I think all things, God is working in all things. It's not the point of what I'm saying, though. During this time, my grandfather left livestock, hogs, cattle. And I remember my papa had a four-wheeler, a red Honda 200 four-wheeler. When I was little, it was like the tires were that big, right? He had this four-wheeler, and I remember that the first big snow came. And when the first big snow came, my dad come and got me, and he put that feed on that four-wheeler, and we went up to feed the cattle. And you say, Chris, that's a good story, but what in the world does that have to be predestined? Well, I also remember those cattle, every time the big snow would come, or every time it would rain, If for those of you who have livestock, what do they do? They go through the fence, don't they? Cow, cows don't get out when it's sun shining, when it's pretty outside. No, the cows bust the fence when it's nasty. You have to get out, you have to get the cattle back in, you have to mend the fence. We could say this. Where I live right now, that's where those cattle would roam. And there used to be an old fence line around that property that kept those cattle in. You see, there was a boundary marked out for them. Are you following me? 
As Chandler says, are you tracking with me? Listen. We could say that God, for loving His people, His people, He marks off their boundaries, prevents them from wandering and being left to themselves. God predetermined their boundaries and their care in order that they would be conformed to the image of His Son. Now listen to me. When you go somewhere and they say, I heard your pastor believes in predestination. They always whisper it too, don't they? You can say, yeah, he does and so do I because God loved me before I ever was. And he set those boundaries out for me so I would be made more like his son. I can feel in my life when I'm getting close to those boundaries. I can feel that tension in my life. Uh, on the back of my Bible here, it's goat skin. And on the back of my Bible, I like goat skin Bibles if, for pastor appreciation if you all want to know that, okay? But why are you laughing for? But on the back of my Bible, there's a big mark in it. What is that mark, you reckon? Barbed wire. And it reminds me when I look at it that when that goat gets up against that barbed wire, when that cow gets up against that barbed wire, it hurts, don't it? Oh, friend, God has marked out your boundaries before time ever existed to keep you more in check, to make you more like His Son. Do you feel when you get close to the boundaries? Listen, predestination is not something you need to be concerned about. It's not something you need to be worried about. It's something you should thank God for. 2 Corinthians 3.8 and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Well, don't you see? God is for you. God has always been for you. So much so that He loved you. He foreknew you. And he set your boundaries out. He predestined you. He didn't pre this is not talking about being predestined unto salvation, as in a shock. Listen to me. Paul does that in other places. In Ephesians, especially, he 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 lays the doctrine out. That's not what he's doing here. He's laying the doctrine out to give you something to stand on. You see, he's making you more like his son. Not just now, but in eternity past he did. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Why is he doing this? He's conforming you to the image of his son to make you more like Jesus so Jesus can be made the firstborn among many brothers. Who is the firstborn? He's the heir of all things. And what are we? We are joint heirs. You cannot claim the verse... <clears throat> We are heirs of God and, and joint heirs with Christ unless you believe in foreknowledge and predestination. Amen. There, I've said it. I've got it off my back. You cannot believe it. I'm going to go as far as to say you cannot believe in the security of the believer unless you know that in eternity past he loved you and set his affections upon you. How are we heirs? It's by foreknowledge and predestination you see there's no time in god god is not bound by time nor space you see <clears throat> paul puts these these prefixes on these words for you and me foreknowledge and predestination but god is outside of time they're meaningless to him it's knowledge and your destination God simply knows and God simply determines all things. You see, God is, is, follow with me, God is eternity past. God is now. And God is future. When you figure that out, you call me and let me know. Okay, so we've got to hurry. We're, them guys downtown are going to beat us to the Mexican, okay? 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Are you okay with that right now? And he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. But it doesn't end there. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Thank you, son. So he foreknew, he predestined, he set my boundaries to make me more like his son, and then he calls. There's two calls. There's the general call, uh, come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. The invitation is open to anybody. People say that, well, you believe in, in foreknowledge and, and uh, predestination, then, then no, it's open for everyone. The call is universal. He will not cast you out. You come to him. But that's the general call. The second call, what he's talking about here is the effectual call. It's the call that has an effect. All that the Father gives me, Jesus said, will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast them out. It's, it's, It's Jesus standing at the tomb of his loved one, Lazarus. And he says, Lazarus, Come forth. That's the effectual call. Friend, when you are born again, you are the dead man in the tomb, and he calls your name, and guess what? You come out. It wasn't that Lazarus sit in there and said, you know, I think that you're absolutely uh, crushing my free will. No, he was a dead man. A dead man is not free. A dead man is dead. Ah, but he calls him out of the tomb. You remember that, don't you? He foreknew. He foreloved. And then he set that fence up in my life and he predestined me to be made like his son now and forever. And then he called. He called me just as he called Lazarus. Now, this call might look different. And I want to stress this for a second. Everyone did not get saved when they sang, just as I am. Not everyone got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. Sometimes God works in the circumstances of your life, right, Joe? He works in the circumstances in your life, the pitfalls of your life, the bad things and the good things, the relationships, the love interests, whatever it is, God works. And in that work, He calls you. He calls you. Maybe it was in a church service. Maybe while you was reading the Word. Maybe it's through just friendship with a believer. But He calls. And I love the analogy that the phone might ring one time and you might pick it up, but it might ring a little while and you hear that ring, ring, and you know that ring might last years. But those whom he calls, they come. Listen, believer, if you have lost people in your life, you pray to God that he saves them and then you believe that when he calls, they come. Listen to what I wrote down here. <clears throat> this calling, this call, this effectual call, is where foreknowledge and predestination splash into the pool of your life and in time for the first time. This is where foreknowledge and predestination jump into the pool of your life. You did not know that God loved you beforehand. You did not know that God set your boundaries out. But when he called you, that's when it entered into your time. This calling is the link. Splash into the pool of your life. And for the first time you see, God has been working on my behalf and I never even knew it. I'm almost done. The next verb is what? What is a verb? Let me ask you that. You know what a verb is? Okay. We had teachers here. I was just making sure they was keeping up on their continuing education. Okay. So the verb is the action word. It's what's being done, right? So we foreknowledge, foreknew, predestined, called. These are action words. The next one is what? 
It's justified. Romans 3 tells us we're justified by faith. But if you go up a few verses from 28, you go like 24, it says it's by grace. You see, it's by grace you're justified. And the instrument that's used is faith. Are you with me? The Bible never says, Boyce said this, the Bible never says that we're saved because of our faith. Uh Uh-oh. I've just distanced myself from a whole lot of people. It's not because of your faith you're saved. It's by your faith you're saved. And guess what? That faith is a gift from God. Boyce goes on to say, the Bible never says that we're saved because of our faith. That would make faith something good in us. Uh Uh-oh. You didn't think you were going to come to church this morning. I wasn't going to say something about we're not good, no, not one, right? That would make faith something good in us that we somehow contribute to the process. But it does say that we're saved by faith or through faith, meaning that God must create it in us before we can be justified. God creates faith in your heart. You're born again and you're justified. I have messed that up so many times. I've preached in church services before, talking about being born again, and I got it all wrong. I'm here to tell you today that God makes you new. He gives you faith, and then you are justified. What is justified? I am declared right. I am set free for for all of eternity, for all of my sins, not just the sins behind me, Can I get an amen on the back row? Not just the sins that that I remember. Because if you're like me, you had a traumatic brain injury a few years ago, there's a lot of things I don't remember. And if it was up to me to remember them, I would lose some, right? Oh, no. I am set free from every sin. I am declared right in the eyes of God by the only one who can, by God himself. So God is for you. Say amen. God has always been for you. Last thing. God will always be for us. Look with me. We're going to close right here. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Do you notice here, glorified is in the past tense. Because in the mind and in the heart of God, it's done. It is so sure that Paul puts it in the past tense, and, but although it's in our future. If you hang around me a little while, you'll realize that I'm not glorified. I know that comes as a shocker. Ah, oh, but friend, it's so sure that Paul could put it in past tense because God has already decreed it. God has already done it. And he is faithful. You say, Chris, I'm not faithful. Join the club, sport. If you were faithful, you wouldn't need a savior. What is being glorified? John towards the end of his life, says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Do you see that he's conforming you? He's making you into the image of his son because one day you'll be glorified and you will be like him. God is for you in the circumstances in your life whatever's going on god has always been for you before you ever draw to breath before your great 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 grandfather ever draw to breath before the world existed he knew you he loved you and he set your boundaries up to make you more like his son but listen he will always be for you you can't mess up enough to change him notice this The last verb is glorified. Who are the ones that are glorified? All those who are justified. Look with me. Glorified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Not one is lost. 
Everyone that he glorifies has been justified. Everyone that's justified are who? The ones that are called. All those whom are called are the ones he predestined. And all those whom he predestined are the ones he foreknew. You see, it's the golden chain of salvation. It's not every specific part, but it's a chain. And all those whom he foreknew, he will glorify. Notice that all five words are verbs, and they are all done to us. You didn't do one of them. I can tell by looking at you all. You couldn't, and you wouldn't. But they were done to you, believer. It's a done deal. As Stevie said, signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. It's not us doing them. Remember, God, as Carson said, is never contingent. He never reacts. He always acts. You get it? God always acts. He's God. We react because of Him. Not the other way around. He initiates. He carries out. And guess what, friend? He is faithful to the end. Closing with verse 31. Verse 31 tells us this. What then shall we say to these things? What things? Foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. What can we say to these things? What can we say about these things? What does these things teach us, church? It, teach us, it teaches us this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Predestination, foreknowledge, God being sovereignly in control of your salvation is not the Easter bunny. It's, it's not the Santa Claus in the mall to be afraid of. There is therefore now no condemnation. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. You see, the plan all along was for Jesus to go. The plan all along was to make him the firstborn among many brothers. This wasn't uh, just a happening. By the hands of lawless men, he was crucified and killed. Yet it was by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God that it happened. God sent his son to pay your ransom. He loved you. He set your boundaries. He called you. He stood you up in front of his throne and he made you right. And one day he'll change you into the image of his son. What shall we say to these things? If, if health fails, if death comes, if, if poverty hits us, if, if whatever happens, happens, if God is for us, who can be against us? Let us pray. Father, we ask you now.